Okay, uh, welcome back to uh, the Cubase Ninja series. Um, starting from scratch, from the very basics here of getting your Cubase system up and running and getting the most out of it. Um, if you recall, in the in part one, uh, we discussed a little bit about how to choose your audio interface inside of Cubase, tell Cubase what physical device we want to have made available to us, and, uh, and to configure it for the proper uh, latency and system resource usage with your, um, your I.O. buffer. So that's a quick recap. If you if you missed that, go check it out. It's available at techmuse.tv uh, or you'll find it here at the YouTube channel as well, uh, Cubase Ninja Part 1. And in Part 2, what I want to discuss today is now that we've told Cubase which audio device we want to be made available to us, we want to also go a step further and tell Cubase what physical inputs and outputs we want to have access to. So let me show you where this is done. If you go into the Devices menu, uh, scroll down halfway down the list or so. It's uh, called VST Connections. Uh, if you click on that, this is where this opens the dialog that allows us to to choose our physical inputs and outputs. Now, there's another way of accessing that, and I highly encourage you to learn your keyboard shortcuts. F4 is the way to show and hide your VST connections. Um, you'll notice, by the way, in the menu, it does give you a hint there that F4 will do just that, okay? So get used to your keyboard shortcuts because they make things a heck of a lot quicker. So anyway, across the top you'll notice uh, in this dialog that there are a number of different tabs that we have access to to make some edits and changes in the configuration of Cubase. We're only gonna discuss the first two today. These other ones we'll, we'll touch on at a later date. But most importantly, we need to tell Cubase what inputs are we gonna be plugging into. If we've got instruments, microphones, um, we need to tell Cubase where they are, where, the, where to listen to. And then, of course, on the Outputs tab, we have to say, well, now that we've got audio recorded and captured, um, when I hit the Play button, where is Cubase going to send that audio out to? Ideally, you want to choose the outputs that your speakers are connected to. Um, there are uh, circumstances where that's not the case, but for the most part, choose the outputs that your speakers are connected to. So here's how it works. Now, in my particular situation, I'm using the Steinberg MR816. Um, it's a it's a, a eight-channel interface over FireWire. It has eight ins and eight outs. Now. It also has an ADAT uh, I.O., which allows me to expand it by eight more inputs and outputs, which I have done with the Behringer ADA 8000. Um, so you'll notice, let's just break down what's going on here. First, you have the bus name. Now, this is editable. Um, by default, Cubase has chosen the first two analog inputs of my device and just called it stereo in so that I have something, no matter if I've done this or not, I have something available to the system to plug into and record. Now, let's say I wanted to, that it's labeled stereo in right now. If I double click on that I can give it a name anything that I want it to uh, to say let's just call it uh, you know in maybe one two for lack of anything more creative um, and just hit the disclosure triangle here so you can see everything that's going on so my input one and two are connected to this physical device which is of course what we configured in part one of Cubase Ninja and then here I can choose the left input and the right input for this stereo pair um, by just clicking here and selecting something from my uh, available inputs. Now you'll notice that um, I have a couple of these, my analog 7 and 8 are red. That just simply means that they are assigned to something already. And don't worry too much about that right now. We'll talk about that in a, in, at a later date as to what I've got going on uh, analog 7 and 8. But I've got it set up here in uh, analog 1 for the left side of my stereo input, and analog two. I can change it to three if I wanted to, I can change it to four, anything I like, but for the sake of this video, uh, an analogs one and two will be just fine. Okay, so now I've only got one stereo input bus, but I have, as you can see from this list, I have 16 inputs available. So right now I can only plug into inputs one and two if I wanna send information to Cubase. So let's say I do wanna add a few more buses. Well as you might expect, you click the Add Bus button here. Now, this brings up a dialog that allows me to choose if I want a stereo or mono bus. That's typically the options you're gonna be dealing with. Um, here, we get into some surround sound options um, that, for the most part, as musicians, we're not dealing with. Stereo or mono is typically all we're interested in. So I'm gonna set up uh, another stereo bus, okay? And maybe I'll, I'll set up two of them, so I'll just change the count to two, actually maybe three, okay? And I'll hit okay. So now in, in addition to the original stereo input that we originally had that Cubase created for us, 
we renamed. I've just added three more for a total of four stereo buses. Now, by default, it'll, it'll, it'll add them in sequentially. You'll notice it's got one, two, and then there's... Actually, it didn't quite do it sequentially this time around. Uh, so I've got five and three, four and six, which kind of doesn't make much sense. So I'll simply jump in here and just change those. We had one and two on top. I'm going to go three and four for those guys. I'm going to go inputs five and six for these guys. And I'm actually going to steal input seven and eight from where I had them previously located uh, for the sake of this demonstration. So now I have four stereo inputs, um, input pairs. So channels one and two on my interface are going to be stereo input one, which I've labeled in one, two, uh, inputs three and four, etc. five and six and seven and eight. So now if I close this up and I go to create an audio track here, um, I can choose a stereo audio track and add the track. Now over here in the inspector, um, by default it chooses my first stereo in. I can go ahead in here and, and select from any of those stereo inputs that I have created and made available to Cubase. So if, I, if, my, if I'm plugged into inputs three and four, I'm gonna select this uh, input right here because if you'll notice in VST connections, stereo in as it's labeled is inputs three and four. So I encourage you to relabel these to something that makes more sense to you. Um, I just named this one just to demonstrate how it was done, but I would change those to something like Stereo 1, Stereo 2, Stereo 3, and Stereo 4. Something simple and sequential like that. Okay, now you'll notice also if I go ahead and create another audio track and make it this time a mono track, add a track, and we'll discuss track types uh, uh, and the pros and cons and advantages and disadvantages in a later video. So now I've created a mono track. So by default, even though I've got stereo inputs, I can still choose just one side. So my inputs one and two, the left, if I select that, that means this track is listening to physical input number one. If I select here the same stereo bus, but this time choose the right side, now it's listening to physical input number two. So it's important that you choose the right input that you are physically connected to or else your track will not record anything, or at least it won't record what you expect it to record. So if you have sufficient amount of inputs, let me just bring up the BSD connections again. I'm going to add another bus here. This time I'm going to add, uh, let's see, we're going to add eight more mono buses. And of course now, by uh, what Cubase has done is it's added them with the only available inputs that are uh, that I have, and it's lay and it's uh, assigned them sequentially. So now I've got four stereo input pairs, analogs one through eight, paired together, and I've got eight mono um, inputs, and they are using my ADAT ins from uh, being fed from the Behringer AD8 8000. So now you'll notice if I close out of this and I go ahead and let's just actually I'll just leave the track that I got here. So this is my uh, mono track, and this is my stereo track. If I take that stereo track and go to choose an input, uh, you'll, there's my four stereo buses that I created, and there's the eight mono buses that I just created. They now show up and they're available to be chosen. But uh, if I choose, say, mono in right here, it, it's, uh, it's a stereo track listening to a mono input. So it's only going to most likely um, listen to... And I can't spell here, look at that. It's only going to be sending audio off uh, at one side of the speakers. So a uh, stereo track, you want to choose a stereo input. So I'm just going to set that to uh, inputs one and two, or maybe we'll just grab stereo input two, make it more visual on the screen. And then I take my mono input. I can choose from any side, left or right, of any of the stereo pairs, or I can go right to these dedicated mono inputs. So if I'm connected to the first input of my Behringer device, then I would select mono in, mono in one. I can label it that if I so desire. So anyway, that's the basics of how to create and configure your inputs. Outputs is the same, exactly the same way, except of course we're dealing with the outputs of our device, obviously. So I can go ahead and again, add buses. If I wanna add a couple of stereo buses, so maybe I have a, um, I'm just gonna add one more. So maybe it outputs one goes to my main speakers and outputs two go to my secondary speakers, perhaps. That's a good way to do it. And uh, inside Cubase, I can send any individual track out of stereo out or stereo out two now that I've just created it. And you can do this for as many outputs as you have available. So that's the basics of uh, input and output assigning in Cubase. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll take it a little bit further next week.